Chamber Assembly, Senate Chamber, Program Sound. Good morning, members. You're very welcome to this morning's committee meeting. Uh, for those who are coming into the public gallery, just to um, alert them to, about the use of mobile devices, it can be used only through Wi-Fi connection. All, de all devices should be muted. Password details are available on the gallery rules for anyone wanting to connect to the Assembly's Wi-Fi network. 3G and 4G should not be used and there should be no recordings or, or photographs taken during the session. The briefings today will be from the Department on Regional Planning and Strategic Planning. That's from, that was deferred over from last week. And uh, a further briefing from rivers and flooding. I've just received the, an apology from David Hildage, who won't be joining us today. I have no chairperson's business. Moving then to item three, which is the draft minutes, which are at page six. They're for the meeting of the 19th of February. Our members agreed that they are an accurate minute. Agreed. Agreed. Thank you. Yep. Moving then to item four, which matters arising at page 14. Matters arising from the meeting of the 19th of February. Do members have any issues? I had given some, I actually had intended to raise it last week's meeting. Um, there had been mention of the utility regulator, and I just wanted to ask if members would be content that we give an invitation to the utility regulator to come to speak to us just in relation to um, the price control. Maybe we could get that um, put into our forward work program at some stage. Members are content to do that. Are there any other issues, Mr Muir? Just in terms of matters horizon, Chair, um, I think we raised it last week and I'll raise it again this week in terms of getting an update from the Department around the MOT situation. This is turning into a bit of a saga, really, to be honest. We need an update on well, it. Well, it has, and I think, um, obviously, there are some newspapers have more information than, than we have as the committee, so I think if we could maybe ask them again just to give us a, a little bit of urgency in relation to do that, because they had been very good in giving us updates, but... Um, I'm guessing there's a lot more information there that hasn't been shared. So. Yeah, there's been an extension obviously granted for months, but that yes. time's now starting to run down, and we need to be able to give guidance to the public, really, because they really are looking to see what the way forward is in relation to this. I understood there was a report meant to have came early last week, but there's been nothing more. So. Yeah, we haven't heard anything in relation to the engineer's report, and nor the, any sort of discussions that had happened with the manufacturers yeah. um, with regards to who, was, who has responsibility, so it might be useful to get that in the discussion as well. I, I agree it should be pursued as to what ha is happening in this area um, and in particular if there are to be any uh, changes to the rules around MOTs to deal with this situation uh, is there a requirement for any new legislation because the four month is fast running out if, if legislation is required yeah. any, any other members any issues in relation to this no. Great, thank you. Moving then to um, item five, which is our correspondence. Uh, on page 18 is obviously the list and the suggested action. Just draw your attention to the invitation which I'd received um, to address the infrastructure working group. Unfortunately, this, this came in quite late and it was too short notice for me to attend. Um, but if members are agreed to note, and in future, they may ask again, and again, it may be short notice, but just to get members' agreement that if that happens, that I can attend on yeah. behalf of the committee. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, other issues? Um, there is a 5.5. We have correspondence in relation to quarry regulations. Again, that's something we might want to raise um, in the sessions we have today. But um, obviously, if you want to forward that correspondence on to the department for comment. So just <coughs> through you, Chair, the quarry licence and stuff, is there, there's nobody here today to answer on that? No? Um, in terms of quarry licence and no? No, I think it may, just in relation to planning. Yeah, um, I did just find out that we update on the <coughs> regulations where we're at. I mean, just okay. like the wee spy. Do you want us forward on for a response to the department, yeah? Yes. Okay. Any members, any other comments? Well, 5.4 is the ministerial's, ministerial response um, as a consequence of the meeting of the 5th of February, um, obviously there's some updates there in relation to a number a number of um, issues that members had raised, including obviously um, the integrated community transport, um, the plans for Hyde Bank, which were raised. Um, the legislative programme is still we're not really any sort of further forward with regards to that at all. 
um, and then there's, there's a considerable um, amount of time spent there on the impacts of EU funding. Mm -hmm. If members have any further questions they want to address in relation to that, Ms Anderson? Um, yeah, I'm looking particularly at the European funding um, for the Derry Coal Rain Line, the technical equipment and infrastructure upgrade. And that's 2015. The information is here, and we have information um, from 2015 of 11.2 million from the EU as a contribution to the 37.8 million that was spent. There's also, this is an Annex B, mm -hmm. um, there's also the Swell NA Water, um, as well as the Source to Tap, significant funding in 2016, 25 million of EU funding. And we have that up until the funding allocations up until 2017, given that we're now in 2020 and the end of spend for this tranche of funding, if we could get more information, and um, particularly with regards to the um, the funding streams, uh, research and development, um, as well as just interreg and the the other the CEF funding. So I would like this further developed because you can see in 2016 there was European funding awarded of 45 million uh, to infrastructure. 2017, it dropped to, but it's quite significant still, uh, 25 <coughs> million. I would like that further rolled out for 2018, 2019, and then with an understanding how the gap in funding is going to be um, bridged as we go forward. Okay. Can you tell me that? Chair, just on the community <coughs> transport um, part of it, could we get a, a proper briefing on, on this, I suppose, really, to see why particularly Strand 2 failed? Um, I think because it, it doesn't really go into detail about that. So yeah. would it be worth us requesting a, a proper briefing in terms of the community transport? We, ha we do have, well, we have community transport coming up um, in, a, week. in a few mm. weeks' time. They're, they're actually delayed now. Okay. Um, you'll see that from the Forward Work Programme. But the... Um, the official who has oversight of community transport wasn't in attendance that day that we received the overall the, the, the briefing, so it might be useful for, if she uh, can make yeah. herself available. That would be great. Thank you. Sure. Sorry, um, just on the Hyde Bank stuff, obviously <laughs> I asked a question previously about the, the emissions test. Now, I know this is a new centre of excellence for the, for the DVA, but... Um, we have an answer in relation to the emissions test and the new smoke test. Is it all going to be generated out of that centre or whatever? That's a couple of years away. There's maybe more clarification on the emission test, on the, the future testing of vehicles. Okay. Anything further in relation to that correspondence? There's a further update there on, on page 27 in relation to the reservoir transfer functions legislation, which was raised um, last week. Um, I was that that 27, Okay. That came out of the, the minister's briefing. We'd ask for further information. Um, but that process is to be made by an order from, from DERA, so it's, uh, we, we are waiting in relation to that. Although when you had asked further questions in relation yeah. as to how this had actually how, happened. Yeah, I was going to say that's given us maybe how you in terms are going to address we, we around the transfer function, but I would like to know, well, how do we get to this yeah. point in we the have first place? We have, we have asked that question, so Thank hopefully you. we'll have that in our packs by next Thank week. You. Chair, um, <coughs> mine is, is really to do with how you define a proportionate regulatory framework, given particular difficulties in my constituency around uh, what are con d d deemed to be controlled reservoirs that were cosmetic lakes, really, which are having a huge detrimental impact on um, planning and development for the area. So I would like to know how, how and do the define mm -hmm. and, and what reference do they use for a uh, proportionate regulatory framework? <coughs> okay. Because it seems to me uh, their interpretation of that has been far too cautious. Well, I think we, we probably all have examples of that. Yeah. Uh, well, certainly we can put that to officials later Thank on you. in today's meeting. Appreciate that. Okay. Members content or any further issues in relation to this? No? Okay. At this point, we can really look at the table papers then at page three, which is correspondence from the Chartered Institution of Highways and Transportation. That's inviting myself to their Northern Ireland 
Regent Annual Dinner, and that's next week. Um, so are members content that I attend that? Yep. 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 We content then with all the suggested man means of addressing each of the correspondents. Thank you very much. Then moving on then to our first briefing, which is from the Department on Regional Planning and Strategic <coughs> Planning. And we will be welcoming um, Angus Kerr, who is the Chief Planner and Director of Regional Planning, Alistair Beggs, <coughs> Director of Strategic Planning, Scott Simmington, Head of Operational Governance, and Susan Wilkin, Head of Plan Scrutiny. You're all very welcome to the committee this morning. And can I apologise for last week? Unfortunately, we did overrun. Um, members were engrossed by the, the issues around budget, so unfortunately, um, we had to delay to this week. So thank you for no problem at all. Thank you. Okay, so if you'd like to um, open with a statement, and members will follow up with some questions. Okay, uh, great. Thank you very much. Uh, good morning, everybody, and thanks for, for having us here today. Um, really, for I suppose an introductory briefing about the work of, of the DFI planning group. Um, I've, Alistair Beggs is here, who is director of strategic planning directorate within within the group, and his deputy director Susan Wilkin, and also Scott Simmington, a deputy director on uh, regional planning directorate. <coughs> Um, the papers have sort of shown you that there's the um, the two directorates uh, within the group: regional planning directorate, which I'm the director of, um, and then strategic that, that Alistair is. Um, if, if, if you're content with this, Chair, um, Alistair and I will give just a brief overview of the work of each of, of the directorates, uh, and then I think there'll be plenty of time for time for, for, for questions after that, uh, if that makes sense. Um, I suppose it's important as well to say that both directorates within the, the department work very closely together um, on the sort of the many complex planning issues that come our way. Um, uh, we have a mixed team of, of professional planners and administrative um, people as well on the team. My directorate is more focused on the sort of policy, legislation, and kind of oversight role, um, and then Alistair's side deals with the um, more operational stuff in terms of the regional significant planning applications and also the development plan sort of scrutiny role. So, in terms of, I suppose, more, more looking at my side um, and a bit of background, um, as, as you'll be aware, um, th since April 2015, we now have a new two-tier planning system uh, in operation in Northern Ireland, um, and this is a major reform and transfer um, of planning, really the single biggest change that we've had since the early 70s to the planning system, um, and it came about through the implementation of the Planning Act, which at the time was the largest piece of, of uh, primary legislation that had ever gone through the Assembly. Um, and involved a huge amount of work at the time with the, with the committee of the day. Um, and really, I suppose that the, the key changes that, that were introduced through that was to create a much more responsive planning system delivered at a local level um, by councils and really with an enhanced local political accountability. Um, it also introduced a new two-stage and faster development plan system with a much less adversarial approach and more meaningful level of community involvement in the process. Um, it focused on a more effective development management system for dealing with planning applications, again um, with a focus on balancing the economic, environmental and social impact um, of those developments. There is imp improved efficiency and processing um, and greater certainty around timescales um, for developers and, and communities. Um, also, a key change that was brought in was a much more front-loaded approach to planning, uh, involving both developers and communities much earlier on in both the plan and the development management <coughs> process, and also an emphasis uh, on collaborative working around all the stakeholders involved in, in planning, um, and ultimately a more proportionate um, decision-making mechanisms classified by different applications to try and deal with, with planning in, in a more efficient way. So, and, and I suppose this new two-tier system of planning brings Nor I brought Northern Ireland into line with um, all of the other jurisdictions in, in these islands uh, who all have a two-tier uh, system. Um, so the last few years, I suppose, have been a period of kind of huge, huge, huge change um, for for everybody involved in planning, um, and it's, I suppose it's been important for us um, in the centre to allow that new system to bed in a little bit and allow councils to get used to operating this new system, members to understand their role 
role in making some of the decisions and also for the planners and, and support staff to get used to that as well. Uh, equally for ourselves in, in the department, um, a new role for us at, at the sort of centre of that new, new two-tier system um, and, and um, trying to get to grips with our role and how we relate with the councils and the work that they're doing at, at the more local level. And I suppose that links in quite nicely into one of the key responsibilities of my directorate within um, the department is about really oversight and governance of the planning system. Um, and the Planning Act itself does confer a range of responsibilities. Um, collectively onto the department, um, which give us an overarching role in monitoring uh, the operation of planning functions. Um, it provides the department with the capability to oversee and secure the effective implementation of regional policy and good practice by councils. Um, and and the, the, these range of powers include things like the power to call in planning applications, and make development orders regulating how councils deal with applications, conduct assessments of council performance, um, and the department also has a series of reserve powers, enforcement powers, and revocation, um, discontinuance, modification, those sorts of powers as well, um, among, among some others. So, um, in addition, my directorate also works closely with councils to improve planning performance. Uh, to do this, we meet regularly with um, the heads of planning from councils and also council directors at what we call our quarterly strategic planning group meeting um, and a number of other meetings and subgroups throughout, uh, throughout the year. We, we publish performance indicators um, against three um, statutory targets. Local applications, the target is 15 weeks. Um, major applications, for which the target is 30 weeks. And enforcement, as well, um, to bring to conclusion within 39 weeks. Um, there's been good progress um, with, with, with some of that, um, particularly around the locals um, and, and the uh, enforcement. Um, however, there are challenges around major applications and the target <coughs> isn't being met with those. Uh, average processing times 18, 19, um, around 59 weeks across all councils. So in addition <coughs> also to those statutory targets, we also published um, last September our first planning monitoring framework. Um, which covers a range of additional indicators about the planning system, because obviously those three um, <coughs> statutory indicators only tell really a very small part of the story. Um, the other indicators that we've developed, um, I can kind of give you a better picture of really what's going on and a better understanding of, of where some of the issues are and actually also where some of the good practices as well. Um, the, the, the purpose of the framework really is to increase that understanding and to drive best practice and continuous improvement, encourage councils and ourselves to, to talk about what's going on. Um, over time, we do want to expand that framework. Um, and finally, on planning performance, one area that has been highlighted as impacting on application processing times recently, in particular, has been statutory consultees. Um, and, and, the, and the time it takes strategy consultees to interact with the system and how they interact with the system. So to address that um, and other factors around performance, we've recently established a planning forum involving all the main statutory consultees to take forward a range of actions um, aimed at improving planning performance. And that was in the back of, a, of an independent review that was done of um, the performance of statutory consultees in the planning system. Um, so my director is also responsible for formulating and coordinating regional planning policy uh, and for maintaining an effective legislative framework for the overall planning system. So the key policy documents for which um, we have responsibility and you'll be familiar with are the regional development strategy to 2035 and also the strategic planning policy statement, which essentially covers all the topic planning policies um, that you'll be familiar mm -hmm. with and used to be in their own separate PPSs like development in the countryside, housing, retailing, renewable energy, etc. Plus, uh, it contains the purpose of planning and also core planning principles. Um, so the team monitors the effectiveness of that policy and how it's been implemented um, and considers whether it's for, fit for purpose and whether it needs to be reviewed and changed. Um, and, and we will be discussing um, planning policy issues with the Minister um, in, the, in the coming weeks. In terms of legislation, again, we will be discussing legislation with the Minister in the coming weeks, but there are ever some subordinate legislation which we have um, already been doing some background work on, um, or particularly around permit development changes, telecommunications, also the requirement to review the implementation of the Planning Act, um, and the subordinate legislation that needs to be implemented through that, and also inflationary uplift of fees, and some other areas as well. Um, the Directorate is responsible for preparing and updating guidance um, and practice notes as well for the system. Um, so if the Minister um, wishes to proceed with the, the, these kind of changes in these policy and legislation areas, obviously that, that they will be taken through the committee in the normal way and um, there will be plenty of debate and also um, uh, in terms of policy public consultation process as well. 
So added to these key areas, I'm coming to the end now, um, uh, RPD um, also leads on the delivery of environmental governance work programme um, to build capacity, training and guidance on, on about around environmental governance in the planning system. Um, and um, the director is responsible for the implementation of um, the executive's Rathen Island policy and action plan, and finally, the procurement of a new shared planning IT system for planning. So that was a very quick whistle-stop tour of all the work that we do um, in, in the team, uh, which I hope gives you a bit of a, uh, uh, you know, a, an indication of, of what we're about. And thank you for listening. And I'm going to pass you over to Alistair now. He'll, he'll talk about his side and what they do. Okay. Thank, you. thank you. Good morning, Chair. Good morning, members. Um, Angus has already explained uh, our close working role that we have with, with his directorate in uh, the regional planning side and that our role in uh, the strategic planning directorate is working more towards the operational side of the department's planning function. Uh, the briefing note before you, I, I'm not going to refer to that in detail, but I'll talk through to you some of the, the major elements of, of the work uh, which we carry out. One of those major areas is in relation to the local development plans which are currently being prepared by the, the councils. And you'll be aware that this, for the first time, the councils can lead the development plan process. It's a chance for the plans to reflect and be responsive to the council's aspirations, the needs and indeed the differences between the councils. And the importance of these plans, I think, can be set out in terms of the way that they are going to guide the development management process uh, in the future. And you'll be perhaps aware that the legislation requires planning applications to be decided having regard to the local development plan and to any other material considerations. And you might also be aware that this is a two-stage process. The first stage of the process is the development of the plan strategies, which will be setting out the general policy framework to guide development in the future, and this is where the councils are in the stage of the process at the moment. Once the plan strategies are adopted, then they'll be working on local plans, which will deal more with the site specifics uh, of an area. <coughs> the department is very much a, a consultee in the process in one aspect, and responses that we've been making to the development plans have been focusing on elements such as the growth strategies, cross-council working and infrastructure availability. And we also coordinate uh, departmental consultation responses to the council's plans, and that's a process which involves our colleagues uh, throughout the department in roads, transport, uh, rivers uh, and water policy. And the department also has an oversight role in relation to the plan process. Um, the department has the power to intervene at certain stages of that process, perhaps to direct our councils to withdraw or amend their plans, and ultimately the department directs plans to be adopted. Now, we're working with the councils closely as we go on through this new and what is an unfamiliar process because of the changes since the introduction of the two-tier system. And we're pleased with the efforts that the councils have been taking in moving their plans forward with this unfamiliar pro process. Now, the table in the briefing paper shows the, the council's progress to date, but broadly all 11 have now um, prepared statements of community involvement and preferred options papers, and seven of the 11 have prepared draft plan strategies which have been consulted on. Uh, I think it's important probably to point out that the Planning Appeals Commission have been asked to hold an independent examination in relation to the Belfast plan strategy, and that will probably occur around about the middle of the year. Following that, the PAC will make uh, recommendations as to that uh, document soundness. Another main area of our, our work, uh, which again Angus has touched on, uh, are planning applications. We currently have about 40 applications before us uh, of various types, and the two that you're probably going to hear most about are regionally significant planning applications and called in applications. Regionally significant applications, the legislation sets out uh, thresholds of what a regionally significant application is, and those fall to the department to determine. And being regionally significant, they're often large, often complex, uh, and contentious. In terms of called-in applications, uh, there's a process 
uh, for calling those in. They could be called in by a minister at the start of the process when they're submitted, or they be, can be called in at the latter stage when a council has made its view known on the application. But to give you a flavour of the sorts of things that we've been dealing with, I think last year we issued approvals for the transport hub in Belfast, uh, a cruise ship terminal down at Belfast Harbour, also a gas power plant down at uh, Belfast Harbour, <coughs> Grade A offices at Embrington and at City Quays in Belfast, and urban extensions to, to Ballyclare. Um, so that gives you a broad flow of quite a wide variety of work which we carry out. And a lot of our work also involves attending hearings and public inquiries before the Planning Appeals Commission. Uh, for example, where the department issues a notice of opinion that it intends to approve or refuse an application, an applicant or council can request uh, a hearing before the minister before any final decision uh, is made. In terms of all our work which we carry out, you'll see that the brief uh, refers to Crumlin Road Jail. Um, you'll be aware that's a very successful visitor attraction currently ongoing there, uh, with almost 1.2 million visitors have visited it since it opened in 2012, and the operator there op employs about 70 people. That's important not only to the regeneration of the jail itself, but also benefits the, the wider community in terms of the employment and training that is carried out for members of, of the local community. And we've had a recently an encouraging response to an invite of expressions for interest in regeneration of the former <coughs> warders' cottages at the jail. Uh, those constitute quite an important frontage along the main road there. <coughs> And the Minister has now agreed that the formal marketing of those cottages can, can be taken forward. In relation to the St Lucia site, which we also have responsibility for, you'll see from the, the briefing note that it was gifted to the Executive uh, in 2010. Uh, the Department does own part of that site, including green areas down by the Struhl River and some of the former military housing on the site. The historic core there uh, remains in the ownership of the Ministry of Defence. And the issue of restrictive covenants, which uh, once affected those particular buildings, uh, was resolved in 2018, and we've been discussing the, the transfer of the buildings to the department with the MOD recently. And it's an interesting site close to Omer Town Centre, but it does have a number of challenges with it in terms of the historic buildings, the, the condition of the buildings, and uh, the floodplain issues there as well. But there's ongoing discussions between ourselves and the Department uh, for Communities and Local and Council in looking at the options available for, for that particular uh, site, and we'll be briefing the Minister uh, on progress on that in due course. So that's a, a broad oversight of the work that uh, we do. Thank you for, for listening and uh, we'll be happy to try and assist you with any questions you may have. Okay, thank you very much. And I suppose really from the outset, declaring an interest that my brother is chair of the planning committee in Lords and North Down Borough Council. I'm not really sure if it is an interest, but just in case someone raises it. Um, Angus, you've, you've spoken very positively about um, the two-tier system, but 2015 was a, a really difficult year um, with, the, with the new councils coming into existence and the planning functions transferring across. Right, essentially, what you had was you had a function with no money following that function. You had new teams being established. Um, you also had brand new legislation, which they had to work with. Um, there's an understanding that perhaps it was poor guidance and inadequate training. Um, both probably for the planners, but particularly for new councillors and old councillors who perhaps had bad habits from um, the, the previous um, planning system. The, essentially, they were advocates as opposed to planners, and yet they were being put in a position where they had to make decisions. In hindsight, um, would you look at differently with regards to how you would have approached um, that, the setting up of that system? <laughs> that's, a, that's a good, good question, a, a difficult question. I mean, I suppose, um, I mean, the first thing I would say was we did do a, a heck of a lot of work um, around the time leading up to the transfer and um, after the transfer in terms of preparing for it. 
um, and capacity building programs for staff and for, and for members and, and all of that and huge amount of engagement and work in terms of um, getting guidance and, and the legislation and all of that right but, you know but it was incredibly challenging I mean I'm not I can't say anything other than that it was you know ref reforming the planning system transferring and not just transferring planning from say one department to another department it was transferring planning to 11 councils which didn't actually exist at the time of trying to sort out the transfer to them so it was hugely challenging and um, there's probably lots of things that, that, that maybe could have been done differently and better and um, <coughs> you, you know, we, we were where we were with, with the way it was done and, and you know the, the other parallel processes of local government reform and the way that that was going through and we, and we had to just get the job done with that. Having said that, looking back now and reflecting on kind of four years of this new system, um, it's not perfect. Uh, there's no way that it's perfect, um, and it wasn't perfect before we transferred it across either. Uh, there, were, there were lots of problems, and there are lots of problems with such a complex system like planning, and it's the same when you talk to um, colleagues in the other jurisdictions. There are lots of challenges there, but I mean, we did, I think, uh, really collectively between ourselves and, and councils achieve an amazing transfer. We, we, you know, the, the world didn't stop. Um, whenever we transferred, applications continue to be processed, decisions continue to be put out. Um, you know, the staffs continue to get paid, which is one of my personal kind of worries at the time. Um, you know, just basic things like that when you're involved in a, in a transfer of that nature, of IT, finance, HR, never mind all the, all the planning processes. So, um, yes, I mean, I, I didn't have the grey hairs before that process, and it was very challenging, and there probably are things that we, we could have done differently. And we, we have done a sort of a, a, you know, a kind of a review process, if you like, internally about the project and, and all the things that we did in the project and the benefits realization and, and, and all of that and there, and there are interesting things you know uh, uh, come, come out of that in terms of what you might do again differently and, and are you satisfied that the guidance and the training that is currently in place is sufficient for um, both planners and for members I think there again there is more work that can be done on that as well I mean we, we, we work closely with Nilga um, to try and um, help them prepare training for members in particular and you know, I definitely would identify that as being a key area where we do need to improve and, and provide even more training there's no doubt about that in addition we have a, a suite of guidance um, which which is there we, we've recently reviewed that and we've actually um, Identify guidance which is really too too old and out of date really uh, and, and counter planning we've taken that off the, the website and we've committed to a program of looking at um, updating guidance and, and preparing new guidance and one of the areas where we we have really focused in on in terms of trying to improve capacity and, and guidance is around the whole environmental governance issue which has been a huge challenge for planning both before and after transfer and um, in terms of making sure that the capacity is within the, the profession and within the councils and our cells to actually deal properly with the very challenging um, environmental um, requirements of EIA, SEA and the Habitats Directive and how they apply to planning. Um, so we've done a huge amount of work there and we will be bringing forward um, new guidance in that area um, in the summer, I think we plan to do that, the first stage of it. Just in relation to the environmental governance, I mean, that's, that's paragraph 14 of your paper. Um, we now have a situation where our applications are essentially being assessed by, by two bodies. We have NIEA, who are obviously the statutory consultee, um, with shared environmental services paid, funded by, by councils. On occasion, they will come back to councils with different opinion um, on an application. So whose advice do the planners and the councillors take? Because essentially that's quite confusing. Yeah. Well, I suppose, I mean, in a sense, this links to the question about the capacity within the councils. Whenever we transfer, one of the issues we realise, one of the challenges about, about the system in Northern Ireland is that councils here do not have all the functions that they have in the other jurisdictions. So it's very helpful to have planning along with, um, you know, conservation, biodiversity, local roads and all of that. And there's an expertise within councils in the other jurisdictions that can feed in to help the planners make the right decisions. We didn't have that in Northern Ireland. Um, so when we transferred, we um, set up the shared environmental service, which in essentially is, is a bit it's a bit like having an environmental expertise within each of the councils, except that we did it as a shared service um, hosted in Mid and East Antrim. So that is, if you like, the, the the shared environmental service is really just part of the council system. The statutory consultee on environmental issues is still DERA. 
um, and DERA ultimately have the final say in terms of the statutory process into planning. Really the purpose of the Shared Environmental Service is to provide local expertise for members and for planners to take what, what um, DERA are saying as a statutory consultee and develop and understand it in terms of how it applies to the planning decision that they're about to make. So it's not, a, it's not to usurp the role of the statutory consultee in terms of DERA, it's to help um, the, it's to bring the expertise within the councils to help um, deal with what DERA are saying and how it applies to planning. Although I'm, I'm not sure that that's necessarily applied, um, so perhaps maybe more in guidance <coughs> around that might, might be helpful too. Um, you've referred to the statistics um, indicating that councils are performing reasonably well. Um, there would be some who may say that this, this pro there could be a manipulation of those statistics and that um, where councils are simply prioritising what would be more straightforward applications and leaving the more tricky ones to later. What would your comment be in relation to that? Well, I mean, yeah, and it, it, that's a challenge across any kind of walk of life where you, you introduce targets um, and indicators and um, you, 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 you don't tend to drive perverse behaviour, um, but sometimes that can happen. I mean, we, we, as I said, we do a lot of work with the councils, and genuinely, that is, that, you know, I, I'm not saying that that doesn't exist, but I mean, I genuinely don't get the sense that that's what any of them are, are about. They are very serious about the role that they're, they're taking on. They're very keen to try and progress it as quickly as we can. I mentioned earlier that the sort of planning forum that, that we set up um, as a result of the, the review that, we, that really head of the civil service um, instigated into performance of statutory consultees, and it kind of broadened into performance of planning, to be honest. Um, and we've done a lot of work with councils on, around that um, and trying to actually understand what are the issues and problems that they have with, with getting applications out reasonably quickly and within the targets, um, and how can we kind of work together to, to address some, some of those issues? So, I mean, yeah, you you could change the targets, but uh, you know it might drive other other behaviour, you know, and that's really not. I mean, my approach is to work with them to improve performance. It's, it's not to get too tied up about targets. You need to have them. And, we, and we've introduced the other indicators as well, which are interesting, and show some of the other things that are going on, um, for, for example, around the, the, the performance of strategy consultees and so on. Um, so, um, you know, it's, a, it's about driving that continuous improvement collaboratively with the councils and helping them as much as we can to, 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 to really take that forward. Okay, and, and, fi and finally for me, I, mean, I have a situation obviously in my, my own constituency and I'm guessing others have too, where um, disused um, quarries have been put back into use. I'm just curious where the department is in relation to the, the review of the minerals, uh, the old minerals planning permission. Yeah, well, I mean, it, it's, it's, it has been around for quite a while and, and there, ha there is a bit of a history to it in the sense of originally when it came through, um, it was at the, kind of in the recession mm -hmm. and decisions were made back before I was ever, ever involved in it to, to, to put it on hold. So we're, we, we, we'd started this kind of before um, the, the minister had come, come in, but, but we're kind of accelerating it now. We're looking at um, what we need to do to um, really properly consider ROMPs and how it can be implemented now in the new system. It is actually in the Planning Act when we transfer it across. Mm -hmm. So it, it, it's there. There may need to be some tweaks made to, to the approach that, that's set out because it sort of goes back to originally 2006, um, and there may need to be some work done um, in terms of how, how we commence that. But that, that's what we're working on at the moment, and we want to talk to the minister about that. So it's certainly an area we're aware of um, that, that is a problem um, across uh, you know a number of um, council areas. And will it be applied retrospectively? Um, well, that's kind of the nature of it. it. In whatever way that it applies, it will it will apply to old permissions, um, and, and mean that you that those permissions have to be reviewed and either kind of revoked and taken away or updated with um, new, more modern um, conditions. Which, when you look at some old um, conditions from the seventies and our old approvals from the seventies, they're like one line, you know, there's hardly any conditions on them, um, whereas if you were getting a permission now for a quarry, as you can imagine, there's like a whole list of conditions and around opening times, noise, vibrations and all sorts of things like that. So it's, it does apply retrospectively, that's kind of the purpose of it in a way, you know, to go back and look at, at, at old permissions and, and, and try and get them into a position where they're meeting modern standards. Mm -hmm. So obviously the implications environmentally, there are issues, but also neighbour issues and um, it's been quite difficult for a number of folk. 
Uh, ab absolutely. The other thing I would say just about that as well is that, again, I keep having, you know, it's sort of one of the things about the two-tier system. We have to engage closely with the councils about ROMPs because if ROMPs comes in, it'll have quite a huge implication on their workload, back to the, the staffing and, and resources and so on, and then, and then also engage with the industry as well. And okay. um, we have had some conversations <coughs> with them on that. Okay, thank you very much, Mr. Buchanan. Thank you, uh, Angus Allister. Thank you very much for your presentation so far. <laughs> I just want to follow on from the chair. She must actually have been reading my notes, but anyway, <laughs> uh, with regard to reasonably well on your oversight role of the council. Do you do any oversight of the applicants or ask the applicants how they feel the process is going? Um, no, we don't actually. Um, that, is, that is something we used to originally under the unitary system when it was planning service, there used to be a sort of a questionnaire was done um, uh, you know, to gauge kind of applicant um, uh, satisfaction, satisfaction with the planning process. But we don't do that now, and I do know that. Um, Is that something you should do? Well, I think that it's it's really part of the two-tier system. It's really a matter for councils mm. to to do that about their own planning service. And I know that um, I know that that some of them, um, I mean, for example, Belfast, you know, are, are working on that on that on that sort of area. It has come up in some of our conversations, and so on. I think it's a good idea, um, but it's a matter really for them to take forward at, the, at that local level. And you see the oversight and rule, if you don't mind getting into a little bit deeper, Angus, so whenever you have your quarterly meetings with my own council, Mad Ulster, for example, yeah. what detail are you going to do with them and how they're performing? Because if you did ask the applicants, they would say they're not performing well. But how deep do you go into that? Well, I mean, there's a set ag agenda that we have, um, and um, you know, Chris Boomer will be there as mm. head of planning for, for your area. All, all the heads of planning are there, plus some directors from, from certain councils. And on that agenda, continuous improvement is one of the items um, that we do go into in a quite a degree of detail. Um, and we talk about um, you know the the overall kind of performance of the system, the, the indicators. Um, there's there's a lot been lots of conversations around, particularly majors. Um, because majors is where the where the um, the uh, difficulties have been, and most of the councils are not hitting their target on, on majors, um, and it's a it's a it's a very open and frank conversation about the issues that they they have. As I said earlier, we're we're developing that into now as well the planning forum, um, where we're, where we at the department are talking to the statutory consultees and how they are performing and inputting into that system, and then also um, at the last strategic planning group meeting. We've um, instigated a subgroup really looking at um, planning performance um, and the performance of statutory consultees, which actually Scott will be chairing, um, and that will be getting into even more detail to feed back up into the strategic planning group um, on what the issues are with, uh, with performance, particularly around, around the majors. Uh, and some of the heads of planning from the group will, will, will sit on that, along with some of their colleagues from councils. You mentioned consulta consultees. Do you have any influence on times for feedback to, you know, and do you take that into account if a council is not performing, that ultimately it wasn't their fault, it was a consultee? Do you take that all into account? Well, it's, I mean, you know, our oversight rule, it's not, uh, you know, it's not that we're kind of delving into every kind of council and every application and, and sort of saying that's not good enough mm. and that's not good enough. It's not as, yeah. it's, I mean, we couldn't do that. We don't have the resources to do that. It's much more of a sort of a strategic oversight rule. So we are talking as part of the work that, that I've described here about the, the 21 days target for statutory consultees to reply on, you know, why is it that some statutory consultees are hitting that better than others? Um, are there things going on in terms of the way that particular target is being implemented? Back to uh, what the chair said about you know statistics, but sometimes um, there's agreement to extend the the 21 day period and so on. So we're getting into a lot of detail on that, but it's focused not you know necessarily around um, lots and lots of individual planning applications. We are doing some of the work on the planning forum around um, the, 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 some of the more strategic applications. Um, with the statutory consultees, so as part of that, um, we do actually sort of at that meeting, you know, I, I will say to the, 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 the guy who's there from Rhodes, you know, the big applications in the system at the moment on your, on your side are, are, are here. Um, there are some of these applications which you know are well beyond the 21 day period. What's going on with that? So there is a mm. there's a little bit of a of a challenge if you like with the statutory consultees, um, but um, it would be impossible to do it you know, for all, for all the applications. The final point then, as the chair sort of alluded to, regarding uh, NIEA and SES, shared environmental services, a lot of obviously agriculture in my area, indeed a lot of rural areas. If you're a councillor sitting in Madalston Council, you're getting a paper saying one thing and another paper saying another, and you're in the middle. So those two are not helping each other, in my opinion, they're not, they're conflicting. And the whole ammonia level issue, which is basically what it is, generally. Mm. 
how do you see that being improved? Because it's causing conflict, it's causing indecisive decision making and no direction, and the councillors are stuck in the middle. Yeah. Um, you know, I'm, I'm aware of that situation. I know it is, it is a difficult situation. Um, and ultimately, the, 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 the councillors and the planning committee have to rely on the advice from the professional planners who, who will be advising them on the application. And they are the ones that will set out, here's what Charlie Consulty is saying, here's what um, the advice of our shared environmental services, here's the, 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 the planning policy framework and the responsibilities that we need to be addressing. And this is the approach that we think we should take for, for this. Uh, and I mean, that is, uh, that, that's planning. Sometimes uh, the, you do get that situation where um, the, the advice coming through from a statutory consultee, whether it's about ammonia and environmental issues or about transport or, or um, flooding, or, or, you know, can be, um, it, it, you know, it, it set aside if there are other material planning considerations, for example, that outweigh it and so on. You know, it must be considered, it must be weighed. But you know, it's not the case that um, you always are following a, a series of kind of um, uh, pieces of advice which point in the one direction. Sometimes there's conflicting device, advice, and really the, the skill of the planner is to balance all of those up and come to the right overall recommendations in the public interest. At the end, you know. Okay. Thank you, sir. Mr. Muir. Thank you very much, Chair, and uh, thank you for the officials coming along. Just a couple of questions that have varied, really, to be honest. Um, obviously, the Plan Act went through in 2011, and the councillors the council sort of came into existence in 2015, formally, to have those plan powers. And I would declare for the record I was previously a councillor on Ards and North Downborough Council, and also a former employee of TransLink. Um, is there a plan to do a review of how that planning system is working now? You know, the number of years down the line, you know, where, where things are, is where things could be approved? Because some aspects have worked well. I think it's good to have planning powers devolved to local councils. These are the people on the ground. But whether there's a plan for a review of that, and I would touch upon some of the issues the chair talked about in terms of sort of the awareness of the elected reps around this. And it's not just particularly the elected reps who are on the planning committee, but it's also the elected reps in the council generally, and also in general sphere of understanding the planning system and some of the issues. Because um, from speaking to planning officers as well, it's important that whatever engagement they're getting, they're understanding the policy context in which they're working. So I mean, that's the first sort of question around the yeah. review and the, the sort of awareness of elected reps. Well, uh, there is a there's a requirement in the Planning Act. It was actually a requirement introduced by the the, the committee at the time, um, <laughs> as it went through uh, to to um, after three years review uh, the implementation of the Act. Yeah. And I think at that time it was because there was a there was a concern that um, we were bringing through an Act before the local government reform had taken place. It back to the sort of complexity of this whole thing. So there's sort of almost a will you know will this happen and, and if it happens how will it happen and so on. So that requirement is there. That hasn't been done yet because we didn't have ministers and so on. And an assembly, so um, that's one of the first things that um, we, we will be talking to the minister about um, in terms of um, complying with that requirement to review the implementation of the Act. Um, whether the, the, the extent and the scope of that review is, is something that we need to talk about that with, with the minister um, and, and the level to what we get into on that, um, I think it's still up for consideration. But it is something that we need to do, and it's something that will be coming through the committee in due course. Um, the, the, the terms of the review will be set in subordinate legislation, and so on. So it will come it'll come to you um, and I think I mean you know in a, in a more general sense then it's back to the, the sort of the conversations that we've been having about working collaboratively with the councils through the various mechanisms that have talked about to try and understand what's going on there and, and continually work to improve uh, performance throughout you know um, the other issue is just in relation to um, the LDPEs and what review is in terms of the pace that some councils have done that some have done it at a much faster pace some have done it slower different views in relation to that, whether it's better to get it done faster or to do it a bit slower, and just a view in relation to that, because some councils are beating themselves up that they haven't sort of progressed, and then, other, then they're also saying that some of them have moved a bit too fast. It passes that over a question over to yeah. Alistair and I. Hi. Um, yes, I think a lot of the councils are still developing their evidence base in yes. relation to their area plans, hence the, the speed of them moving forward through this process. Obviously, the, the new system of LDPs is now based on soundness and uh, evidence base goes to the heart of that. So I think a lot of the councils are still gathering that and, and um, getting their positions with that. Um, and I think, yes, a lot of them have, have sat back and maybe seen how others have, have moved forward, and, and maybe that's to their benefit too. So. Yeah. In terms of this LDP process, um, the, we, we had the map, and yeah. there was a legal challenge to that. Is the view that the process we're having now in terms of developing these LDPs will 
make it a bit more robust in terms of protection from legal challenge, because one of the concerns is that councils are making decisions based upon extremely old development plans because of the legal challenge to BMAP. It's important that these LDPs that come forward are actually be able to get these in place, because the planning decisions that are being made are based upon information and data, which is very, very old. I think that's the desire, of course, to get a full suite of plans. Um, you know, people relying on, on draft BMAP at the minute is, is not, I suppose, unusual. Yeah. Decisions have still been made. Um, with this being a very new process, there may well still be challenges to this process that we haven't um, foreseen yet and from where we don't know yet. But we're working with councils to try um, at the earliest stages of this yes. process, point them in the direction of, of, of producing the soundest plans that, that yeah. we can get. I think that's important to do that and to work mm -hmm. together with them to ensure that occurs. D just a couple of other things. was um, In relation to the call-in, you've outlined the applications that were called in. What specific criteria for calling something in that you go by? Think well, yeah, <laughs> it's, it's, it's a kind of an interesting thing we've done within the group. We've, we've, the decision about whether or not that we call in is kind of on my side, and then if, if I decide to call, if we decide to call something in, then it goes, or if the minister decides to call something in, then it goes to the operational side for, for, yeah. for, for um, Alistair to deal with the application. Yeah. That's quite a deliberate thing, yeah. um, and um, of course he gets cross if we decide to call things in. But <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, so I mean, essentially the, the the criteria is 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 really around. Um, I mean, the first thing I would say is. Calling a planning application in is an exceptional thing for us to do, and it is not the department's intention. It's the same in all the other jurisdictions, and we've had conversations with um, the sort of chief planners and so on and the others about this, because this is one of the big questions about our new role um, in the centre of a two-tier planning system. So it is an exceptional thing that we will do, and we do not want to get in a situation where we're calling in lots of planning applications and essentially undermining the whole purpose of the transfer of planning to councils, um, where uh, councils are supposed to actually deal with these planning issues themselves um, and not, you know, if people are un unhappy with it, go to the department, the department will call it in, or if it's a difficult application, go to the department, the department calls it in, and so on. So we definitely, have sort of, that's a kind of a key thing that we um, wanted to sort of lay down as a marker from the start. So the the, the, the criteria, if you like, are um, is really around whether or not it is a, a, a matter of sub-regional or regional importance where you know it's really a matter for the centre for the region as a whole, not a map, not a local matter, um, and so that can be, for example, an issue where um, there's there's a there's a a, a regional policy um, on a particular issue, say on built heritage or on flooding or something like that, where a, a, a decision that a council is making um, is, is actually deemed to be undermining. Um, the, uh, the operation of that regional policy by setting a precedent that would mean that the policy is kind of undermined going forward and so on. So that is really the key test around that sort of you know, sub-regional, regional, regional um, issue raised by the application and therefore <coughs> it's something that we would deal, be more appropriately dealt with by the centre. So it is not about, and we keep saying this, it is not about whether or not the, right, the council have made the right planning decision. You know, it's not. We don't sort of uh, decide to call it in because we don't like the planning decision. We decide to call it in because we think that this is an application which would be better dealt with by the department and the minister, because it's of regional significance and regional importance, and it raises issues of regional issues. So, it's, it's, it's quite a kind of a. It's taken us a while, if I'm honest, to get to grips with all of that and to, to understand that, and, and a lot of discussions with how, how they work this in Scotland, and England, uh, and Wales. Um, uh, but that's that's the way we approach it, and we've kind of got into that way of doing it now. That's really useful because it brings real clarity in terms of how that <coughs> occurs. But see when they're called in, or if there's applications already deemed to be regionally significant, um, and the current legislation has a situation where the minister makes a decision in relation to that. Uh, I'm aware of others. Scenarios in the British Isles, such as Amber Pernola, but also the UK Infrastructure Commission, where that was sort of taken a bit away from ministerial direction. Just don't know what the views are really in relation to the benefits associated with that and why we decided to go down the ministerial route. That's about making the decisions, Alan. I'll <laughs> get my chance at last. <laughs> no, in, in terms of, of actually ma making the decisions, yeah. we, we think the system that we have in place at the moment seems to be quite responsive to our, our particular needs. I'm aware of the, the situation that. Uh, you have on board Planola yeah. down south um, looking at the decision, but we always have the scope here for the Planning Appeals Commission to become involved in any public inquiries or, or hearings, so we get their independent advice on, on many occasions. And I think that uh, has been quite effective as well. 
when they get their view, and that can then be rolled into the decision-making process. So at the moment, uh, there's, you know, I think we always need to keep our, our eyes and ears open as to best practice elsewhere yes. and, and what's going on. But at, at the moment, I uh, wouldn't perceive any potential changes at the moment. Just one last thing. Um, the whole issue of climate change is clearly here, and people are, know that's a real issue. We should have been that a couple of years ago, or many years ago. Um, but one of the things around planning is that you know how much is that considered nowadays in terms of applications. So, for example, when houses are being built, they're not ready for e, e cars and stuff like that. And whether that's something the department can give direction on, or is that something we're waiting for the councils to do? Because we need to be building, you know, for the future rather than for the past. Yeah. Uh, again, a, a good question. Um, I mean, the, the strategic planning policy statement, um, when it came out in, just after transfer in 2015, did actually reflect the, the, the issue of climate change quite well. So it does require um, councils both in making their decisions and, and ourselves as well in making our decisions, um, and in terms of them bringing forward their development plans to take account of, of climate change and the implications of climate change for planning and um, probably in, in, in the way that they are bringing forward um, those decisions and those plans. I think, though, if I'm, if I'm honest, there is probably a bit of capacity building and a bit of um, you know guidance and so on still needed to try and actually tease out more clearly what that actually means for planning and what the role of planning is in, in contributing to climate change, um, reducing the need to travel. If you if you bring forward effective plans which actually think through the issues of commuting and and um, the, 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 you know almost developing a town or a city in a way that that, that creates more need to travel, that's obviously going to have an impact on on um, climate change and, and, and on CO2 em emissions and, and so on. So I think um, there, there, there is a requirement, um, but I think it's an area that we need to probably try and do um, a little bit yeah. more work on. Yeah. And I don't know, Susan, on the okay. plan side, whether or not you want Yes, to... well, obviously, the plans that are progressing at the, <coughs> at the minute are doing so on the basis of existing mm -hmm. policy. So the draft plan strategies that have been um, um, come forward already, they do refer to climate change, but probably in a way in relation to mitigation, yes. and that would be through, as you say, um, you know, sound land use planning and, and transport issues, and maybe mitigation against flooding and so forth. So it has been a feature, of course. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Ms. Kimmins. Thank you, Chair, and thank you for your presentation. It's just a couple of questions, I suppose. In uh, notice in the briefing paper, you mentioned around Caseman Park, and I suppose at the minute it's kind of centre of, of um, a lot of what's happening since the Assembly has come back. Um, I suppose just if, in relation, I know the briefing had stated that, you know, depending on the finalisation of the further environmental information process, there was a potential for a decision um, at the springtime. Are we still are we still on track for that? or, or Yeah. So, certainly at the moment, you said, you know, that's something that's been very current uh, in the news yeah. issues all around Casement Park. Uh, mm -hmm. It's one where there's uh, quite diverse views being expressed to us, uh, and those are views which we have to take and run through the process and look at fairly fair, fairly and objectively when we come to make a final conclusion. Um, in terms of timescale, I know that the issue is you know, possibly a decision round about Easter time has been mentioned in the press. Uh, while I can't confirm that, that to be the case because it has to run through the processes. Uh, that is a possibility. I would leave it at that. Well, that's good. And I suppose and then in relation to that at this stage is all outstanding information um, for the progression of the project. Has it been accounted for? Do you foresee any other delays as, as, as it stands? Mm -hmm. In, ter in terms of planning applications, uh, until you actually make the final de decision, you know, there's always an opportunity for some additional information to come in. At this stage, uh, the last information which we uh, asked for from the applicant has been received, that's been consulted on at the moment. Uh, we don't know what the consultation response will bring up on that one. All I can say is, you know, from a, a planner's point of view, you always hope that, that you're at, at the end of that process. Okay. Um, and that hopefully that will allow us to, to go forward. Okay. Um, no, and I suppose at, at this stage there's been so many delays with the project. Mm -hmm. People are very, very keen to see it um, come into a decision. Um, just one other thing on that one. It's just I know one of the outstanding issues was around no noise pollution with the social club, and obviously with a new case in park, it's going to be probably a, a lot more well attended. Um, has that been resolved at this stage, or is that still an issue? 
In terms of this, uh, in terms of how a planning application is work, we won't come to any recommendation uh, before all the information is is before us, you know, and uh, you know other objections and letters of support in relation to that. So all these matters, once we have all that information to hand, we'll collate that and come to a recommendation before we place anything before a minister. But this time, because that's still in formation mm -hmm. and we haven't come to any conclusions yet, I can't really go any, any no, farther in relation to that. But. That's grand. Oh, thank you. Okay. Um, just in terms of, I suppose, the planning act and plan reviews, I've just recently come to the Assembly from six years in council, so very um, familiar with planning and planning issues and all of that type of thing. Um, you had mentioned there about planning performance, and it's just really, um, in terms of the, the stats around that and, and for the 11 councils, do we, you know, is there any way we can even see those or where, you know, are they published or what? what it's really, it would be interesting, I think, because I know some of the issues we face. I, I was nearly worn and down, and you know, we would have have people complaining and things like that, which I know is probably right across. And um, so it would be interesting to kind of get a sense of, of where that all sits, um, you know, and, and maybe not for today, but just going forward, even if we yeah, were able to no, they're absolutely, they're, they're um, available. The the statutory um, uh, indicators are available. They're they're monitored quarterly, and okay. then there's a sort of an annual report put out on those as well. So they are available on our website, and okay. you can see you know um, <clears throat> the performance of individual councils and, and the overall performance. Um, although you know um, a lot of the work that we're doing with the councils is about trying to kind of get away from that kind of. You'll be familiar with it in, in, in councils. You know, it's almost like a competitive thing. It can be good in some ways, but we're trying to work much more collaboratively with them to try and bring everybody up to sort of a you know a, a, good, a good standard on it. Uh, and then also the the the, the, um, the planning monitoring framework is is published um, annually. So that was published in September, and that contains more information. There's just sort of a couple of pages on each council yeah. and how they're doing um, on different issues. Okay, no, that's fair enough. And I suppose, as you, like as you said, it, it's not a good system of people are working competitively because everywhere has their unique issues and things that, that can cause difficulty so I suppose it's trying to nail those down and, and, and find ways forward. So just I suppose in relation to the Plan Act as well I know that um, it requires the department to review it every three years. Um, it's after yeah. three years and okay. then every five years. So at, at this stage of a date for review? I'm sure well, as I was saying earlier, the, the, we, we, we're already obviously we've missed three years, yeah, so um, we'll be talking to the minister about bringing forward um, the review <coughs> of the implementation of the Act and what the terms of that review will be, and that has to be set out in supporting legislation, which will come to the committee. Yeah. Um, so that will be in the next sort of month or two. That will okay. be coming here. That's fair enough. Okay, no, that's fair. That's great. Thank and you. Just, and just on that, do you collate information in relation to the number of judicial reviews that have been taken against each of the authorities? And then that yeah. was that as to whether or not they've been successful. Or That's actually one of the, that is one of the issues that has come up um, at the strategic planning group, um, and where actually we, we did ask, uh, t could we try and get um, information from each of the councils on judicial reviews? Um, it's been difficult to be honest to get that. I'm not quite sure why we've been pushing it. Mm -hmm. We also tried through DSO to go in and get information um, through the courts. Um, on it, um, but again, that that they don't really collate the information if by council area, so it's a work in progress. I think on that, um, it's something that we'll be taking up with the the heads of planning again on the strategic planning group to try and understand. I mean, I you know I think it's definitely worthwhile to try and understand what's going on around the judicial reviews. We obviously do keep a very close eye on on judicial reviews as well in terms of when they come out and we would um, analyse those and try and get to grips with what you know key things are being said. You know, and there have been some very interesting um, decisions recently about the way councils make decisions and so on, mm -hmm. um, which we are talking to the councils about. And for example I put out a chief planner's note every so often and the last one referred to that, um, the Knox judgment <coughs> which is around the kind of decision making processes. that councils um, take for making decisions. Of course an excessive number doesn't necessarily mean there's an a a problem in the the council either. There could be someone who's very disgruntled. And they exactly. Want. Yeah, absolutely. You have to be careful with statistics. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, um, Miss Anderson. Uh, thank you. Thank you for the presentation. When you reference the statutory process of planning being in in Dara, do you mean with regards to the environmental compliance, or is that a general um, application? of the, the statutory process where it is located. And I say that because um, as a committee we're pursuing how by default we're told that the statutory responsibility for the Reservoir Act 
is in Dara, but the the staff are in the department you work in. So we were wanting to, and when you said that, it rang a bell with me. I thought, is this another part of this where part of the responsibility is located in one department, but the staff are in another? So just generally to 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 get an understanding of that. Um, also, I see uh, that part of your key responsibilities is north south spatial planning, and to get a handle on where that's at, what kind of spatial planning is being done. Um, on an all Ireland basis and then in the context because I'm assuming that um, as part of looking what will happen in the future relationship what could potentially happen with the level playing field not being in there with the environment not being in there then how is that going to impact when you may have two different regimes of environmental compliance north and south and to get an understanding of where you're at with working with uh, your way through how that is going to play itself out. I have a particular concern about the Maboy dump scandal. Uh, I raised it at the, at the last meeting, but um, I had hoped to, to engage with yourselves, and I appreciate the opportunity to do so today. And you talked about the, you said the, about the amazing transfer process that has, has taken place. Um, I'm not sure if this is around the strategic, whether it is in uh, the strategic planning directorate, um, Mr. Beggs, or are you with yourself, Mr. Kerr? Um, but I would like to get a handle on what has happened since the mill, the mill's review. When you consider the language that that report used around flourishing conditions for eco crime. Now that's a damning indictment on any department for a review to talk about illegal dumping that had taken place, illegal waste, is <coughs> essentially getting planning permission to do so. So I would like to understand, and, and this is maybe where there is overlaps, because you talked about oversight and governance, and particularly in the context of environmental compliance and that being part of now within your own directorate. But perhaps the retrospective planning might have come from uh, your directorate, but you could explain that to me. Um, a firm, which Chair I will not name, obviously, who has been involved in the, in the boy responsibility for acquiring. And it is my understanding that there were a number of retrospective, uh, ret retrospective applications um, that were put in for after quarrying took place for illegal dumping waste to be put in those quarries and those applications were given. Not on one occasion, not on two occasions, not on three occasions, but more. And that, has, uh, that is really creating a lot of concern for, uh, for particularly the residents and the people of Dari around the River Fawham. And I say that, and I know we're going to be dealing with this later, Chair, around uh, flooding. But in 2017, uh, where we had a situation where the abstraction point could not have been used because of the flooding that had taken place there, and there was concern around the Fawham about the water uh, potential contamination that may or may not have taken place, and there's still people concerned about that. So how many retrospective planning applications were given to the quarrying of, uh, for, for illegal waste then to be put into? And then to, what, to understand what is the scale of retrospective planning, and I say that I understand that people come along and there's retrospective planning applications, and of course that process uh, is necessary uh, and should be supportive. Uh, but not for, in my opinion, repeated uh, retrospective plans for illegal waste dump to, to go into a site. Um, so those are the concerns uh, that I have. And I would like to know, because of the situation that has taken place, what learning has been done from the Mills Review? Where are we at to ascertain and to give certainty and assurances to people that what happened before will never ever be repeated again, where we will give planning application retrospectively to a firm 
who is involved in what the report calls a flourishing condition for eco-crime. So if I could uh, just get some uh, understanding, I'm not sure if it falls into either or both of your remits. Thank, thank you for that. Chair. The, 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 um, w w if, if it's okay, um, there's a number of issues there you've raised. So I think there's one around the statutory consultation and the DERA thing and the North South Spatial Planning Point. Um, and I think then you've raised kind of general questions about retrospective kind of planning and so on. Um, which, if, if, if maybe if I deal with those sort of three, um, and I'll maybe pass to, to Scott to talk about the retrospective planning when, when it comes to, because Scott's been doing some work around the environmental governance work uh, on that. Um, and then finally, if, um, if Alistair deals with my boy, because uh, because he, he's been working on, on my boy, which is kind of, I suppose, the specific example of all of this. So first of all, on the statutory consultee point in DERA, um, the, it's not another example of, of that transfer, thank, thank goodness. Um, you know, I'm kind of looking back at colleagues who probably will be talking later on about, about some of that stuff on the reservoirs, but um, no, it's not that. It's basically just DERA appropriately. They're the, the statutory consultation body for planning on nature conservation issues. Okay. So they're the, ex, the statutory experts yeah, no, we go okay. to in planning no, for, 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 for those issues, and, and, they're, and they're in the right place for that. In terms of the North South Spatial Planning, um, we do do a lot of work, um, both with well, we do a lot of work on planning with all the jurisdictions. Um, sort of twice a year, um, there's a chief planners meeting with um, all five. Um, we call it the five administrations meeting, where all five chief planners get together and move around the different countries and talk about shared um, kind of concerns and angst around planning. Um, 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 and it's a very, I find it a very useful meeting because you can talk about there are very similar issues that we all deal with, and um, you know there's different solutions and different innovations and ideas that come from all the jurisdictions. We work specifically with colleagues down south a lot as well. We have a collaborative framework for cooperation, which um, was established a number of years ago. Um, I went through the executive, and that allows us to um, you know link up. Uh, we, we've done work um, with um, the Derry and Donegal councils who are doing a lot of work together on the north. West, um, and we, we, we've we've attended um, lots of conferences and seminars, and, and worked with them on that. We do work on um, the sort of development plan side in terms of bringing together plan managers um, from um, the border ca counties, because obviously you you know a lot of the you know planning doesn't just stop at the border, and, and the environmental impacts don't stop at the border, and the, and all of that. So there there is there is work that goes on. Um, it's kind of a mutual benefit um, within that within that, within that framework. Really across a number of areas. The regional development strategy and linking up with what um, the, uh, the Republic of Ireland are doing around their you know, national uh, development plan um, and the national planning framework and so on is another area where we, where we collaborate on. There's, I could go on, there's, a, there's work going on in the north-south um, uh, Dublin corridor um, and Espon kind of proposal that, that we're taking forward in that that's looking actually at the impacts of climate change on that corridor um, and, 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 and so on. So, so there is some work going on on that. Um, I'm going to pass over to, to, to Scott just to talk. But just before you pass yeah. over, could you maybe explain um, what work you're, that you're doing just forecasting into the future, particularly oh, yeah. as we go through this transition period and the level playing field not being there and the implications that may or may not have for planning? Yeah. Um, no, the... the um, I suppose the current situation with that is that in this transition period, there, we, the, the, the regulatory regimes are the same. So, you know, EIA, for example, applies down south, applies here as well. Um, but we are um, involved in the work that's, that's being taken forward um, centrally, I suppose, around frameworks for the different policy areas um, like uh, environmental governance and so on. So we link up with DERA um, who, who are you know, doing work around the environment bill and, and that sort of thing. We also link up with our colleagues uh, in MHCLG in, in London uh, around um, the implications for planning of EIA, habitats, regulations and um, strategic environmental assessment and how those will all be handled uh, going forward uh, within the, the, the UK. Um, but have you done an impact assessment of having to potentially work two different regimes? As you said, it doesn't stop at the partition part of Ireland. So planning is something that you know is across the island, and the work that you've already been involved in. So the implications of environment not being included in the level playing field for here and having a different regime here than what it would be 
and uh, in the south, and then how that is going to impact on that planning application process yeah. or the work that you're doing around spatial planning. Yeah, no, we I mean, we haven't done a specific analysis on, on that, but that is probably something that we we, we will look at. But we're, we need to try and understand, you know, how is it going to actually. Um, end up and work out in practice is there is there going to be kind of complete regulatory al alignment around mm -hmm. the environmental issues um which would make sense and and would help planning um so until we kind of get a, a, a an understanding of that it's probably difficult for us to to do too much on that but it's certainly an area that we're fully aware of and and and, and, and you know considering and, and, and working with colleagues both down south and um locally here and and, and across the water so if, if um, Scott maybe <coughs> wants to say a bit about um, the, 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 the tricky issue of retrospective applications, the environmental governance issue more generally. Yeah, I mean, obviously the planning system allows for retrospective applications, but um, over time concerns have been expressed for a number of reasons, particularly over minerals applications, because retrospective applications for minerals tend to, minerals applications can result in significant harm and irreversible harm. Um, and as part of the concerns that have been raised, we, we have been looking, uh, we've developed an environmental governance work program because of various concerns and escalation and environmental concerns in the planning system over the last number of years. But one of the key things we're focusing on is the issue of uh, retrospective minerals applications and unauthorised EIA development. Um, and so we're currently actually developing the first tranche of the EIA guidance, which we intend to produce hopefully before the summer, will be specifically on the issue of how to deal with retrospective minerals applications. Um, one of the issues with them is that they'll often attract uh, requirements under the environmental directive, EIA directive. And once you get into the territory of retrospective applications being unauthorised EIA development, then there's a lot of case law which um, suggests that the bar should be very high indeed for a developer to get planning permission for that. So that's something, but it's a very, very complicated area uh, of planning because the EIA directive never actually, it didn't envisage a situation where you would have an unauthorised development for which you'd have to get retrospective or uh, application or permission after the fact. So the principles around how you deal with that has built up through case law. So guidance around this hasn't actually been produced in any of the jurisdictions yet. So we have a draft of that guidance now, which we need to run past our senior counsel before producing it. But yes, I mean, a lot of that came out of what happened in and around the Maboy Road site, which um, obviously there's been various complaints at different levels about how that was dealt with. but. One of the issues was obviously dealing with retrospective applications rather than going in and enforcing robustly against the, uh, the, the quarries. And I think one of the lessons to be learned in the planning system is when you, it comes to unauthorised development, particularly potentially very harmful development like unauthorised minerals, is that councils and or the department, as the case may be, should go in and take robust and swift enforcement action and not end up in the position where you have to deal with retrospective applications. And because a boy road, because you arguably that culture, if you like, perhaps created some of the conditions for the illegal dumping. So we're very aware that it's, it's but, important. But how was that allowed to happen, given that um, you didn't need to get to the end of this process to realise, Houston, there's a problem? You know, this, this um, assembly had a motion in 2014. There had already been um, information that was brought to the departments from, from 2011, 2012, even before the assembly to, uh, debated this chair. So how many applications did, uh, did, for instance, that particular firm receive? When did the department decide we need to put a stop to this and not allow the spread of the quarrying to take place so that more illegal dump being could, could uh, could happen as a consequence of it, because to end up with a report that talks about a flourishing condition of eco crime, and really that illegal waste was essentially done with planning permission, is an absolute shocking indictment, and you don't need guidance to know that that's a problem. Um, so, it's at what point did the red flag? Uh, what plot point was that? Was was that waved in the department to say this must stop, and we have got a problem, and this is extending, and uh, we have mission creep here with regards to dumping that's spreading out. And then, as a consequence of 2017, we, we, we have a situation where the abstraction point 
uh, that that could not be used for the Fahan drinking water, water because of the difficulties that that could potentially cause to, to the residents and citizens of Derry. I think we're probably getting into specifics about Maboy. I don't know, mm -hmm. Alistair, if you want to maybe yeah. update mm -hmm. on where we are with Maboy. Um, yeah. I mean, you have asked uh, a question about uh, a situation at Maboy, which, you know, if you were living there or in, in the vicinity, clearly that's something that was going to cause you great concern. And as you also said, the Mills report responded to that. And I know the recommendations that have been taken forward by our colleagues in DERA. In terms of the, the planning application history, I can't think off the top of my head uh, anything in regard to retrospective consents, but I can confirm and that can, to your committee. Chair, could we ask for some information yeah. on that? Just we can certainly uh, get, that, yep. get that for you. And with the dates around yep, when We can they certainly happened. do that. At the moment, uh, certainly DERA is carrying forward its own uh, investigation into that, and there is to be a court case heard in relation to events out there, which I think is due to be heard about September of this year. Uh, for s reasons regarding that, um, I wouldn't want to go into too much detail in relation to that. We also, as a department, have enforcement notices on the site, and uh, we're sort of we have a close working relationship with our colleagues in DERA in, in relation to how we go forward from where we are now, and I think uh, that is important to focus on, is how we try to resolve the situation in relation to, to the site, and uh, we're looking at uh, an integrated remediation strategy with our colleagues, again, that's being headed up by uh, DERA, and uh, a number of uh, the department or the directorates within the Department for Infrastructure are on the, the relevant project board there. So there's good liaison in relation to that and we would hope to, to move on forward from there uh, with, with all the stakeholders. Um, the Planning Commission Appeals has already said that the enforcement order has to be taken forward. So there's already been a challenge to that. and. It has already ruled that despite the knowledge that you've just imparted here and, and members are aware that there's an ongoing case, but even that was notwithstanding that, they said the enforcement order needs, yeah. to, needs to be implemented. Yeah. There was uh, a hearing in front of the Planning Appeals Commission in, in relation to one of the notices and the time scale that was given uh, for that to, to be enacted. But it's uh, the sort of thing in relation to all those notices. Any action on the, the foot of that would clearly need to be discussed with the minister and in the context of, of the situation at the time and also having regard to how the remediation strategy is coming on. So we'd obviously want to be in, in close contact uh, with everybody involved there as to how things are, are proceeding. Members probably content that we can maybe return to this again yeah, and we'll follow it up with um, correspondence if yep, required. Yep, okay. Thank you, Miss Anderson. Or, I'm sorry, Mrs. Kelly. Thanks very much, Chair. Um, Chair, can I just pick up though? I understand there was substantive illegal dumping on the River Foyle as well at the Fawn River, yeah. And uh, I'm not sure if that's subject still to uh, legal proceedings or not. But I, I believe that there was a cross-border element and organised crime gangs involved. And I just wonder, you know, had the NCA expertise been brought in in pursuit of those responsible? And if the fines were insignificant in relation to being able to bring, uh, or sorry, if the criminal evidence was insufficient, had any thought been given to go under some of the unexplained wealth orders? In relation to some of those responsible, yep. is, it, is it this um, separate to the Maboy? Yes. Can I clarify? Mm -hmm. I'm afraid that certainly that might be a matter for the, the council. I'm certainly not aware of any detail in relation. Maybe it's in relation to Dara. Uh, well, I find it strange because NIEA were involved. It will not be for yeah, family. I know, and it was probably it moved to the Dara. environment bit. Yeah. But we'll, we'll chase that up too. Mm -hmm. um, Perhaps, sorry, can I just, uh, I mean, most of the points have been covered, so I'm not going to go back over them, but I understand uh, in terms of the area development plans and in terms of um, the uh, voluntary exit scheme that the department's staff and resource was de deplenished considerably, uh, and has that had any impact then on the time frames in relation to the uh, development plans, and if so, uh, have you been able to bring in some uh, additional expertise to assist because 
the plans do take a considerably long time. Uh, you know, you could lose the will to live waiting on them, really, you know. I mean, the, the, I suppose at the point of transfer, the vast majority of planning staff left the old DOE and moved over to councils, uh, with only a small kind of rump retained here, and about 400 staff moved, moved across. Um, you know, broadly lining up with um, the old, if you remember back, the old planning service divisions. There have been six divisions, so that was converted to 11. 11 councils, um, and there was some additional staff, if you like, and had to be put in place to facilitate that in terms of you know heads of planning and so on. Um, but I suppose <coughs> since then, uh, you know, um, the, the councils have recruited, you know, uh, generally um, some more than others uh, to, to to bring staff in. And I think probably, um, you know. The, uh, the councils would say, you know, we would like to have more resource. Um, we would say, well, we transferred everybody that we had across, um, you know, and, and um, uh, over time they, they have actually been able to add to that and, and, and supplement that. Um, and I think that's a good thing. It's been a good thing for the planning profession generally. It's allowed um, graduates to come in to, to the profession who weren't actually for quite a number of years before that able to, to, to get jobs in, in Northern Ireland. So. Um, Yes, they probably would like to have even more resources and bigger teams bringing forward the plans. But I think, you know, as Susan has said and Alistair, there's been, you know, quite good progress across all 11 councils. Um, when you consider all the change and all the new processes and the new approaches, um, you know, and yes, we're working on them to try and bring those th things through even more quickly. Um, but, um, you know, um, progress has been okay, I think, uh, you know, this far. But, Chair, I just want to put in record I think I've had a lot of experience in terms of delays by other statutory consultees, and I would urge the Department to uh, chew them along a bit and look at the process and timeframes. But that's about all. Everything else covered, Chair. Thank you. Mr. Boylan. Thank you, Chair, and thank you very much for your presentation. Angus, you're welcome by. You. We're not this uh, you're a happy chap, you know, your football team's doing okay. <laughs> uh, I have a number of questions, Chair, and I'll, I'll try to move through them as, as quickly as possible because I mean I, I was on the committee that, that transferred the powers and we had a long discussion and it's interesting hearing some of the points from some of the members. There are things we can learn from, but we often said be careful of what you wish for when we transferred these powers. And we have a number of councillors here now coming off council who've had the experience of that. But I just want to pick up on a, on a few points and then have a number of questions to ask directly. Um, in, in terms of the, the um, overview of the Act itself, is there now an opportunity to look at the workforce model or is that solely down now just to, to councils itself? Because clearly there, if you look at the points you're saying, Angus, in relation to the average number of weeks in taking the process forward, Maybe it's an opportunity to look at because I mean all of us have working relationships with most of the council. I mean, ABC Council knew him more than I deal with mostly, and I mean we we know some of the pressures are under, but you know some of the good decisions being made. So I would just say in terms of the review, let's have a look at the, the workforce model. As far as the committee is concerned, there's a number of um, you said there's a number of subordinate legislative pieces to come forward. We get sight of that, or I mean obviously the block on the committee here maybe to look um, to support some of those pieces. Maybe you can throw. Um, the other ones, there's I've, I've a number of questions, so I'll just try and flip through. Yes, the uh, LDPs, I mean, they're, they're not extinct from the from the Regional Development Plan. So, obviously, uh, the question we're really asked is I mean, councils now have the autonomy to do their own thing in terms of LDPs, but there should be a wee bit of ambition there in terms of develop the areas because the ABC councils are. A relatively big council now, so I'd like to see for the development, and I'd like to see that recognised. And I don't know whether that's in the nine or eight parter process, but certainly I would like to see, you know, given the opportunity to do that. I am. Um, the other point I'd like to make, and maybe you could, um, the issue of although we say Lucia, but Lucia will do. Um, the issue of the coven. I mean, I know that a number of MLAs and. Councillors had contacted us in relation to that site. It's part of a broader programme for council, and they're keen to move the process on and develop. Could you maybe expand, or, or where exactly we're we at? I mean, people would be keen to see that for that area. And I suppose I've, I'm, I'm going through quickly here, Chair, as quick as I can. There's there's not a number of questions, and probably 
Angus, they're over to you in relation to. I want to just pick on the Dalradian Dal gold mine stuff in relation to um, that process. There was all the information submitted there. Could you give a wee, wee update in relation to that on maybe the issue of a public inquiry? Uh, the ARC 21 process as well. I know there was a number of complaints in, in, in light of climate change and light of the environmental issues that the people are raising now. Just I want you to maybe respond to that in, in relation to that. Uh, the issue of developer contributions. Uh, I know that as part of the, the Act we had introduced that. I know Scotland has brought forward a new model now in terms of developer contributions. And I'm, I'm mindful of the fact the opposite end of developer contribution is where that actual cost goes. I do believe that developer contributions should be used for communities, uh, green initiatives, and anti-poverty measures. So if we were looking at that, I, I'd prefer to see it used that way, but I'm mindful of where the cost would go <coughs> in relation to that. I mean, um, if a developer was to put that on site, where would that go? But even in terms of major infrastructure projects. And on my final point, I want to just pick up if I can. The issue of permitted development rights on oil and gas exploration and, and uh, petroleum exploration. Um, just we updated on that. I know there was talk about removal, there was talk about uh, consultation in relation to some of the stuff. Um, the options were brought forward to the Minister. Is there, um, could you expand a wee bit on how we could find out where we're at for that and whether the committee will see the, the site of those consultation responses? I mean, clearly, it's, it's it's predicated on the issue of the, how the people's mentioned climate change and all of those green issues. There's a lot of opposition out there to, to those things nowadays. But just a wee bit, if you'd like to respond to some of those questions, <coughs> I think that's all the ones I have, Chair. <laughs> okay, there's quite a lot there. So, um, <clears throat> what I would propose is, um, Alistair will deal with sort of St. Lucia and already in R21. Um, uh, and the local development plan uh, one, and uh, if, if I pick up the rest of them, if, that, if, that, if that's okay. Um, in terms of that sort of issue about the workforce model um, and staffing uh, and so on, um, I mean, that's really in the past now. We had that sort of model at the point of transfer, and we're now in a situation where it's really up to the councils to look after their own staffing and their own, and their own resources. Um, we, we don't really have a role there with um, with that. We can't. Um, I mean, we do we do do a bit of work with them in terms of interchange, where there's an opportunity for some staff to you know move across and work in a council, or for some council staff to come and work in central government, which is really good for staff development and and, and um, uh, career development and so on. But really, in terms of the model, it's really for each council to, to sort that out themselves. Um, the, the issue about the subordinate legislation program that kind of leads into the oil and, ga oil and gas question. Mm. Um, uh, um, we, 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 we will be coming forward with uh, subordinate legislation across a range of issues, um, would be my um, assumption. But I still have to have the conversation with the Minister about. Um, the various different pieces of, of subordinate legislation, and um, we'll be talking to her, for example, today about the telecommunications um, area, and we're, we're permitted development um, proposals in and around that. But again, that'll be for her to decide. And should she decide to go forward with that, then we will, of course, be going through the usual subordinate development, um, subordinate legislative process, which will involve yourselves here in, in the committee. Um, so there are a number of areas, and, I, and I, which, I, which I touched on, I think, at the start: telecommunications, the review of the Act. Um, uh, and also um, the issue you have mentioned um, about um, oil and gas. So we did, um, uh, as you alluded to there, um, in 2016 go out for um, public consultation um, on um, options for removing permitted development rights for oil and gas exploration. Um, just, to, just to kind of be clear about it's about exploration, not about the actual um, um, you know, um, extraction of, 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 of those um, minerals. Um, and um, we will be talking to the Minister about um, the outcome of that um, and about the options um, for taking forward that removal of permitted development rights for, for oil and gas. And then, I suppose, um, as I've said, subject to what the Minister decides, we will then be coming forward, if, if, if she decides to remove those permitted on match, we will be coming forward with um, uh, the, the subordinate legislation uh, to the committee uh, to, to do that. Um, 
The developer contributions um, issue um, uh, is an interesting one. That's one of the ones that we have um, had quite a bit of engagement with councils on um, since transfer, um, and probably one of the things that has been a feature of the new two-tier system is that councils have actually made a bit more use of developer contributions in Section 76 of the of the um, of the Planning Act than maybe the old DOE would have done, which took quite a sort of a conservative approach to developer contributions. So the power is there, as, as you rightly said, um, and um, it is being used by, by some councils. Um, there are issues with it in terms of, of um, the viability issue. You know, um, it's, a, it's a brilliant facility that the planning system has to make sure that um, through a planning agreement that the developer contributes to the implications and impacts of a particular development by providing um, infrastructure, um, by providing a contribution towards um, some other impact that the development may have, and, and, and you know, it allows you to take on board um, issues like um, climate change and green issues as well. In terms of um, you know open space provision um, uh, and, and other issues as well, so that is there and that is a power that can that can be made use of. There is a viability issue, as you've rightly said, and um, you know you can you know you've got to get that balance right about what it is that's reason for the developer to contribute to, um, and with a view of actually where does the money come from, if you like, for, for for all of that. So that is something that that we've worked quite closely with the councils on, tried to encourage. We introduced. Um, uh, a practice note on developer contributions in section 76 so that that's been kind of published and is available on our website and sort of sets out how um, to operate that, uh, that that function and we have been pretty clear with the councils that we feel the best way for them to deal with developer contributions is actually to, to um, flag it up in their development plans because then developers have an understanding of the expectation that will be around a particular site so there's no intention of widening the scope, even having discussion with ministers down to the councils now on the authority in that in relation to, yeah. Well, uh, um, it, the scope is the scope set in section 76. You know, it's it, it, it's developer contributions um, and a planning agreement really around the um, actual um, development itself and, and, and mitigating the implications of that development in planning terms. There is the whole wider debate about. Um, if you like, like a community infrastructure levy type approach, which they have in, in, in England, um, which is almost more like a levy or a tax, um, which applies um, uh, not through like a Section 76 type agreement, but, but just applies generally to um, um, certain types of development in certain locations. Um, uh, but uh, that would be, I think, that would be in this jurisdiction something that you know would need to be taken forward at executive level, because um, it would it, it's based really around an understanding of the overall cost of, if you like, to the public person servicing a town or a city, um, and then coming up with what's a reasonable contribution that could be made by developers in that area, um, and a levy set on that basis. So that's something that's obviously out with this department and, and individual councils cuts across the whole of government, okay. education, health, and so on. So um, there, and there was some thinking done that I think you know in a previous assembly, but uh, it is something that maybe could be taken forward. Um, I think that's unless I missed anything. The, 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 the my stuff that um, on those issues. So I pass over to you, Alistair. Yeah, yeah. Thanks, Angus. Um, just to go go through the, the queries there. Um, St Lucia. It's a fascinating site there on, on the edge of the town. So we can understand the, the great uh, interest in it and, and how that's going to be brought forward. Um, at the moment, we've been discussing that with the Department for Communities and who have been bringing forward a, an outline, strategic outline business case for the site to look at potential options for the site. That's something that we'll be briefing the Minister on in due course. And there's lots there to, to look at, the, the historic core, the, the difficulties um, with the condition of the building, with any old building that's been left for a time. They'll have to be brought up to a certain standard um, to look at. There's also issues around the, the existing military housing on, on the site and how, you know, how everything relates to the Struhl River and, again, with everything across that river there and, and the open space over there. So we do hope to be you know, taking something forward to the Minister relatively shortly in relation to that. In terms of, of the planning applications, uh, you've referenced Dalradian. Um, now, at the time of the submission, you'll recall that cyanide had been proposed to use to help extract ore as part of the processing on the site. I think it was about August last year the application 
was amended to remove that process from the, from the site and amendments were made to the application. A significant amount of further environmental information therefore came before to us to, to be assessed. That's uh, in the process of going through the system at the moment, um, but at this time, you know, as with any planning application, it's difficult to comment on the, on the merits of the case when they're still being processed through. Art 21, we recall the situation there, the decision uh, to approve the application was quashed by the courts. Again, that was submitted back to us, and um, again, further environmental information was submitted in relation to that, and again, uh, that is again going through the process of being analysed at the moment. And that's really where, where we stand with, with those particular applications. I hope that answers your, your queries in relation to that. And uh, can maybe pass on to, to Susan. Yes, um, you're right. The, the local develop, development plans, the plan strategies that have come forward to date are all ambitious and they all want to grow and the department would be, of course, um, supportive of that. In terms of the early engagement that we have with the councils, we always um, bring them back to the fact that this is now in a soundness-based approach to their plans moving through an independent examination. And in that respect, we would ask them to look at their evidence and make sure that they are producing or suggesting policy that can be um, effective and coherent and can actually be um, can actually work, because those are the issues that will be tested through the independent examination. Newry Morning Down and uh, um, Bambridge plans at the minute, they're both at the earlier stage. They haven't produced their plan strategies yet, so they're still uh, moving through that process. But early engagement with us and other stakeholders is, is key in this process, and we, we are very supportive <coughs> of that. We sit on um, a number of plan working groups and steering groups to, to feed as much information and uh, provide as much guidance to the councils during this process as we can. Thank you. Mr. Beggs. Okay. Uh, thanks for your uh, information you've given us. Um, and I'm looking at in terms of the um, indicators that you monitor the world planning decisions or planning decisions generally. Uh, you've indicated you basically look at the time, length of time that it takes um, for local decisions, for uh, major planning decisions, and then uh, I, I've, I've come, it's come to light that the target for major t planning decision was 30 weeks, but the last time that you've indicated it was monitored was 18, 19, some 59 weeks, almost twice the target. What's happening here? Um, yeah, I mean, th this has been the area that's been the most difficult and the most challenging in terms of, tr of, of trying to get um, performance to, to move forward a bit, a bit faster. Um, the the thresholds that, that, that if you like, um, uh, identify which applications are major are, are actually quite high um, in, in terms of the, of, of the new two-tier system. That's something that's come up a number of times about maybe something that we need to look at. So um, the major applications are, to put it another way, there's actually quite a lot of fairly major applications that fall into the local category. So for example, um, housing developments under 50 houses are local. I don't know if that's really right in Northern Ireland because um, if you have 50 um, house development in a, in a kind of a town in Northern Ireland, that's quite a big that's quite a big development. And to be honest, we don't have that many uh, housing developments over 50 houses. Um, but if they're over 50 houses, they're then major. So it gives you a sense of of the size of the major applications. They really are the big ones, and they are the more complex ones. Um, so they are the ones that, that the councils are struggling to deal with. The, the the local ones um, do encompass quite a lot of, of um, fairly significant development, which they are dealing with a lot better and a lot more a lot more quickly. But look, as I said earlier, it's it's a key focus that we're that we're um, we're really focusing on um, the in the review of the planning system commissioned by Hawks and the planning forum that was set up, Assembly Council Tees, the work that we're doing, the strategic planning group and, and the subgroup that Scott is, is, is chairing. There's a whole range of, of, of work that, that we're trying to do to try and push this down. 
and it's not just as simple as um, you know the statutory consultees are slow or the statutory consultees are late. There's a whole range of, of issues around case management um, and the approach that councils take to, to, to dealing with the, the individual applications. The, the, the nature and quality of the application when it comes in is a key factor because quite often we have a culture here in Northern Ireland where developers and agents put in applications which really aren't of a sufficient quality. Um, and some of the other jurisdictions would just be kicked back out again. Um, so, you know, we're looking at all these areas. Those figures were 18, 19. What's the current figure? Um, I th that's the latest kind of figure that I that I have. We do monitor them. Um, we do monitor them at, um, quarterly. So I can get you. I can get you the more up to date figure. Um, I can certainly send that back through um, okay. after after the meeting. Uh, and is there no assessment of the quality of decisions that are being made by councils? Um, Mention was made of uh, judicial reviews, uh, but you don't even have that collated by, by council. Is it not possible to get the postcode? There's hardly too many judicial reviews in Northern Ireland. You know, is there not a mechanism of, of solving this, either talking to other departments, the relevant the court service or other department, or simply just getting the postcode and working out which council they're in? I mean, what, what sort of numbers are there of them? Um, I mean, again, it's difficult. It's difficult to say, um, and that's part of the reason why we've been trying to investigate if we can get this information um, by, by, by council. I mean, there aren't there aren't a huge number of, of, of um, judicial reviews. Uh, are you but monitoring other possible red flags, such as when councillors take decisions against their local planning uh, officer's recommendation, um, against the local area plan? And in particular, are you monitoring whether any dominant groups on planning committees? Um, are going against the planning officer and the area plan? Yeah. Well, I, that, that, I talked about the, the planning monitoring framework that we published in September, um, and um, that's the one that includes some additional um, indicators which are trying to really tease out more about the quality side of things. So, for example, that includes um, the um, stats on the number of planning applications decided by planning committee, the percentage of committee decisions uh, decided against officer recommendation, um, per percentage of applications made under delegated powers, and things like that, which are all indicators as to you know how efficiently and effectively the committee is working, and uh, gives you a sense of the, the extent to which committee maybe is is overturning um, officer decisions. And also, we've been working with the PAC um, to try and introduce a, a an indicator to, to the next one around um, the performance of, of councils at planning appeals. You know the, the, the number of planning appeals that they're that they're winning and losing, which is also an indicator to sort of the quality of the decisions which is which is coming through. And is this information available publicly? Um, well, well the, yes, the the planning monitoring framework is was published on our website. Uh, was published in September, um, and the, the the intention is that we do that every year. And um, we also do. Um, you know, uh, through the sort of the, the notification process that we have built into the, the, the planning system, um, where decisions are made that are contrary to statutory consultee advice, they are notified to us, and that's one of the situations where we can we can decide whether or not to call a planning application in, and we do monitor that, so we have a good sense of you know the, the, the number of times that that is, that is referred to us. Okay, turning then to um, some of your other areas of responsibility, Crumlin Road Field and, and St Lucia Barracks. Uh, the criminal law jail, you said that it's, it's out to a private company to, to manage and run it. Um, are they paying rent or is the department paying the rent? <coughs> no, they're, they're paying, paying us at their uh, LSE and they're contributing. Uh, I can't remember off the top of my head the, the, the exact figure which, which they contribute, but yes. Okay, and you'll be going through some form of competitive process for the new... They went through, um, a yeah, okay. that's the intention at the okay. moment. Turning to St Lucia Barracks, then, um, there's 40 homes on that, uh, which were lived in and presumably up until 2010. Mm -hmm. uh, have they been sent empty since then? They have been empty. Uh, they're the sort of building, really, that they're not up to modern standards at all. Uh, I think my recollection is they're probably a single brick construction, therefore they're not really suitable to put uh, people and families into at, at the moment. Um, this is an asset, and the, and, the, and the department's under significant financial pressures. Are you proposing to move the asset to a housing association, to sell off if we're not using it? What's, what's happening with this site? Well, at the moment, uh, what we're doing is simply considering the options uh, for the site. It has 
I say it's a, a very interesting site with its particular location, but it does have issues which you need to look at in terms of getting access uh, into the site, the condition of buildings and so on. That's something that, that we're working on and discussing with uh, the Council and the Department for Communities. So at this stage, we have no firm proposal to bring forward, but we will be briefing the Minister in due course on, on potential options for, for the site. Would you accept that public assets have to be used for the public benefit, and the sooner a decision is made to utilise this asset, the better? That's 10 years ago it was gifted to the Northern Ireland Executive, and 10 years is a long time. No business would sit with that empty during all that time. Yeah. It, it was one of the, those sites where we, we have had the issue regarding the restrictive covenant, which was only taken off in 2018 okay. to look at as well. But yes, we, we appreciate that that's something that, that we need to look at and try to bring forward. Okay. Okay. okay, thank you. Um, Angus, you mentioned in your introduction that you are currently looking at bringing forward some legislation, and obviously the committee are very keen to get a sense of when that might be, because we've spoken to a number of officials who have said there's legislation coming, and I suppose we really want to look at a timetable going forward. So have, do you have any concept of what that may look like? Um, <clears throat> I mean, I think that... The the, pieces, the various pieces of support and legislation which, I, which I've referred to today are in the next few months, but I'm, I'm just conscious, I mean, I haven't had discussions with the Minister on them yet, so that's what I need to do before I can kind of be definitive ab ab about it. But I mean, you know, assuming those conversations take place and we decide to move forward with them, they're, they're being advanced of the summer. Um, for, the, for the vast majority of them, and I, and, I, and I mean, I know I'll be working closely with the team to make sure that as soon as we know um, something is uh, going to be going forward, that we, you know, pass on the, the timescale uh, to yourselves so that you under, you can begin to plan your work and uh, make sure that it fits in with with how how you and guys. And this will be secondary legislation as opposed to primary legislation. Yes. Yeah. That's useful to know. I'm conscious that perhaps everyone may bring things in a rush together um, towards the end of the mandate. Um, we only have a, a short time left, really, yeah. um, considering the, the time that it takes to, to scrutinise. But thank you very much. Um, no one else has indicated. So thank you very much for your time this morning. Thank you. Very much thank appreciate you. it. Thank you. Members, if you're content, we're just going to break for a couple of minutes. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. yeah. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. Okay, thank you, members. Um, our, our next briefing was rivers and flooding, and we have run over our time quite considerably, so if members are content that we'll defer that to a later meeting. Great. Okay, thank you very much. Moving then on to the draft forward work programme, just draw your attention to that at page 55. Community Transport Association, they've, they're now unavailable for the 4th of March and they're rescheduled for the 6th. Strategic planning day um, was for the 11th of March. We're going to reschedule that to the 18th because we may not have time if we're going to get a briefing from Northern Ireland Water and um, a tour. So we'll move it to the 18th and then the briefings that are scheduled for the 18th will be rescheduled for the 1st of April. And the visit to Wright Bus will also be rescheduled as well. So this is all very fluid and a bit of a work in progress. So if you're content to bear with us at this stage. Um, Ms. Chair, just to see when we're looking at the work programme, it might be helpful just to say to the clerk, see where you were talking about a tour or any, if that was put in there as well. Is it, is it in it? Okay, it's not in, I'm looking at mine, it's not here, but that's okay. Okay. So just to clarify, with the Chelsea on the 4th, we have 
just uh, the departmental briefing on uh, roads and Translink and then the rivers people as well. No, we, we'll have to reschedule then them to another day. It's just proven like difficult to get through this business. It is. It's going to be very difficult to have. Oh, right. We've only got two briefings okay. and we can't get through two briefings at okay. the moment. So. Okay, so um, if you're content then to agree that. Yes, if um, if you look actually f at the forward work programme where it says committee visits, visits, visits I'm just realising how now to read the <laughs> information that says. <laughs> okay, thank you. Bear with me. Uh, moving on, me way the members of any other business? No. No. Okay, thank you. The next meeting will take place next Wednesday, the 4th of March, in the Senate Chamber. Meetings adjourned. Thank you. Thank you. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber.